In this video tutorial series, we'll be looking at the fundamentals of organic chemistry and nomenclature. In particular, we'll be looking at how to name and draw simple alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, cyclic hydrocarbons, as well as the major hydrocarbon derivatives, such as esters, ethers, ketones, carboxylic acids, etc., etc. If you wish to skip ahead to a different video in the series, click on any of the links located on the left-hand side of your screen. Otherwise, in this particular video, we'll be looking at a brief history of organic chemistry, how organic chemicals can be represented with structural diagrams, as well as a brief introduction to isomerism, the main reason why organic compounds have such long and complicated names. Because the video is pretty long, about I think it's over 15 minutes long, uh, you can skip ahead to any portion or chapter in this video by clicking on the links located on the right-hand side. If you would like a copy of any of the handouts being used inside this video tutorial, uh, download instructions are located in the description section for this video. So just underneath the video itself, there's a description section. Click on the link and it'll tell you how to download your own copy. Otherwise, let's get started. So what is organic chemistry? Well, organic compounds were initially defined as those that are derived from living organisms. What that means is anything that could only be created by a living creature was considered to be an organic compound. Everything else was inorganic. Furthermore, organic compounds were said to contain some sort of unmeasurable vital force, uh, the essence of life, whereas inorganic compounds lacked this life force. Because scientists could not create life in the laboratory, they believed it was impossible to create organic compounds containing this life force. That is, until 1828, when Friedrich Wohler accidentally synthesized urea, an organic compound found in urine, through the decomposition of ammonium cyanate, an inorganic salt. Now, the creation of urea in and of itself, not a huge deal, not a big discovery. I mean, I make urea at least five times a day. But the way that Friedrich Wohler synthesized the urea without the aid of a kidney, without using an organism, that was huge, and that broke down the barrier between organic and inorganic chemistry. Suddenly we had to redefine what was organic. Uh, today, organic compounds are essentially defined as carbon-based molecules, but there are exceptions to the rule, such as carbonates, carbon oxides, cyanides, and elemental carbon. But essentially, organic chemistry is the chemistry of the carbon atom. So, why carbon? Well, carbon has four bonding electrons, and this allows it to bond to a variety of different elements, such as hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and the halogens. Carbon can also form strong single, double, and triple bonds, not only with these elements above, but also with itself. This in turn allows carbon to form long carbon chains known as polymers, and these tend to be very, very stable, and very few elements can actually do this. Lastly, Carbon atoms can bond together to form a variety of geometric structures, uh, such as coal, graphite, diamond, and fullerenes. In each of these cases, the only atom that's involved in creating this uh, compound is carbon. And depending on how carbon is assembled, how carbon is put together, we have totally different physical and chemical properties. Diamond versus coal. They're both carbon and yet we have totally different physical properties between coal and diamond. So now that we understand the importance of carbon to organic chemistry, let's take a look at how structural diagrams can be used to illustrate the arrangement of larger hydrocarbons. For this example, we'll be using uh, the complete structural diagram, condensed structural diagram, and line structural diagram to represent C5H12, a simple hydrocarbon. But before we start, if you need a quick refresher on how to draw line diagrams, you may wish to watch my uh, video tutorial on that topic by clicking the link in the bottom right hand corner over here. Otherwise, let's begin. Typically, when we draw structural diagrams for organic compounds, we like to start off with the carbon backbone or a carbon chain. Now, if you recall, carbon has four valence electrons, which means it has room for bonding up to four different atoms. Since I'm going to continue drawing my carbon backbone and uh, this molecule has five carbons altogether, I'm just going to put in the other four other carbons. Now carbon, as you call, can make four bonds altogether, 
this carbon here has only made two bonds, which means it's got room for the third and the fourth bond over here. Same with this carbon, two more bonds are available, and this carbon, two more bonds are available. This terminal carbon, the one at the end, has only made one bond so far, which means it has room for three more. Since hydrogen only has one valence electron, it can only form one other chemical bond with another atom. And since we have 12 hydrogens in this particular molecule, you can probably guess where they are going to bond onto. And there you have it, a complete structural diagram representing C5H12. Every single atom in this molecule is now stable, with every hydrogen bonded once, and every carbon bonded four times. 12 hydrogens in all, and 5 carbons, C5H12. Now that you've learned how to draw a complete structural diagram, you're probably never going to have to do it again. More likely, you'll encounter the condensed or line structural diagrams. The reason behind that is, well, with a complete structural diagram, you're drawing in all these hydrogen atoms, and that is completely unnecessary. With a condensed structural diagram, we still draw in the carbon backbone. However, with the H's, well, since this carbon has bonded once, it's got room for three more. So, three more H's. This carbon has bonded twice, so it's got room for two more H's. Same with this carbon, and same with this carbon. And once more, with this carbon over here, it's made one bond. Carbons are allowed to have four bonds, so it has room for three hydrogens. Now, whether you draw your CH3 at the end, like this, or like this, it doesn't really matter. However, my personal preference is to write the H3 over here because, well, the whole point of a structural diagram is to illustrate the arrangement of the hydrocarbon, the arrangement of the atoms within. So my H's are on this side because, well, looking over here, the H's are on this side of the carbon, whereas over here it looks like the H's are almost bonded with the second carbon over there. But both are acceptable, I just personally prefer this method instead. Although more efficient than a complete structural diagram, there is an even faster way of representing hydrocarbons, and that is with a line structural diagram. So, pay attention, follow with me now. To draw C5H12, you'd go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And this is a line structural diagram for C5H12. You see, in a line structural diagram, all vertices or endpoints represent a carbon atom that has been filled to capacity or saturated with hydrogen atoms, unless otherwise stated. So for instance, this carbon atom over here has made one bond, which means it has three more bonds available to bond to hydrogen. And that's why there are three hydrogens attached to this carbon. This carbon over here has made two bonds, and so it has two more bonds available for hydrogen. Same with this one and this one. Now this terminal carbon at the end, just like this one over here, has only made one other bond, which means it has available three hydrogens to attach to it. And so this is why the line structural diagram is so much more effective. We already know how many hydrogens are attached to each carbon, so why bother drawing them in? Now, what do I mean by unless otherwise stated? Let's go back to this example. By drawing in a bromine atom over here, I'm showing that a bromine atom is bonded to this carbon over here. So this carbon has already made one, two, three other bonds, so now it only has one bond available for a hydrogen. Now this over here, this endpoint is not going to be a carbon because it says it's a bromine. So unless otherwise stated, this is going to be a bromine atom because I've stated otherwise. And if you wanted to know how it would look on a complete structural diagram, I would attach a bromine atom over here and notice how the bromine atom is attached here. And because of one, two, three, this carbon over here can only afford one more bond with a hydrogen. Well. This carbon over here can only form one more bond with a hydrogen. Same down here, one hydrogen, and you just draw in a bromine instead. Our final topic in this introduction to organic nomenclature is that of isomers. 
these are compounds with the same chemical formula but different structures. Now within isomers there are many subcategories, however for now we're only going to look at the concept of structural isomers or constitutional isomers. As was shown earlier, C5H12 can be represented in a line structural diagram as shown here, but at the same time this line structural diagram also represents C5H12. Let's just double check. This one over here represents a carbon atom. Carbon can have four bonds. Well, it's made one bond so far, so that means it has room for three more bonds. Each one bonded to a hydrogen, so that's three. This carbon has two bonds currently attached to it that we can see, which means there are two more hydrogens attached to it. Over here, we have three bonds, so that means only one hydrogen is attached. Here we have one bond, so three hydrogens are attached. Same thing over here as well. Let's double check. Do we have five carbons? One, two, three, four, five. C, five. Do we have 12 hydrogens? Three, six, nine, 10, 11, 12. And so there you have it, C5H12 as well. So these two have the same chemical formula, but they have different structures. Thus, they are known as isomers of each other, specifically structural isomers or constitutional isomers. At this point, what I would like you to do is pause the video and try to come up with the third structural isomer for C5H12. Now, be careful. Just because you make it look different doesn't mean that it is different. So, for instance, these two compounds are identical. All you have to do is just tilt your head to the right and they look the same. Same with this situation over here. Even though it looks like you've just bent the arm backwards and it's totally a different structure, uh, it is the same structure actually. What you can do is to write the condensed structural formula for each and every one of these and see if they are identical. Because if they are, then you have not made an isomer. It is just the same molecule. You've just uh, drawn it differently, that's all. So for instance, in each of these three cases, their formula is shown here. Nothing has changed. CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. So because they're all in the same order, they are the same structure. You've just uh, drawn them differently, that's all. Meanwhile, this isomer of uh, C5H12 goes CH3, CH2, but then a CH bonded to two CH3s. So as you can see, the formula is totally different. Thus, they are isomers of each other and different structures. So give yourself a few moments and try to find the third structural isomer, please. So hopefully by now you will have found the third structural isomer for C5H12. If not, here is the answer. So let's double check and make sure that this is C5H12. In this carbon in the center, we have four bonds already. Since carbon can only have four bonds, there are no hydrogens attached to it. This one over here, this carbon has one bond currently attached, which means it has three more bonds available to bond onto the hydrogen. Same thing over here, same thing over here, and same thing over here. Do we have five carbons? One, two, three, four, five. Yes. Do we have 12 hydrogens? 3, 6, 9, 12. And there we have it, another isomer, uh, C5H12. Let's just make sure that it is definitely different from these other two isomers over here by writing in the condensed structural formula. So we have a, H, a CH3 bond to a C, bond to a CH3, and then two CH3s sprouting out from the center. And looking at these ones over here, we can tell that they are definitely different from one another. Although they have the same chemical formula, C5H12, the expanded molecular formula or condensed structural formula are different for each one. So they are isomers. Quite often in nature, form follows function. What that means is, depending on the form or the structure of the molecule, you can have a totally different function. And this becomes a problem when it, uh, when it relates to organic chemistry. Because even though they all have C5H12 as their chemical formula, 
obviously their structures are totally different, which means that their functions can be totally different as well. So how can we as chemists differentiate between three different isomers? The answer is with a very specific naming system. As you can see, each isomer is given its own unique name. Moreover, each name provides specific details as to how the atoms are arranged or put together in that particular molecule. And this is the reason why organic compounds have such long, long technical names. But we will cover that in our next video tutorial.